Sure. Uh, my name is Richard Tan, and uh, I'm Malik Washington's attorney. Okay, and you and can you introduce yourself? Yes. All right. I am Nube Brown. I am the managing editor of the San Francisco Bayview National Black Newspaper. I am also the partner of Malik Washington. Okay, let's talk about what is going on with Malik Washington, which is the reason that we're all coming together to have this conversation today. Who would like to begin? Uh, I, I can start with some of the background. Um, Great. About what happened. Yeah. So um, Malik is the editor of the San Francisco Bayview um, newspaper. And uh, he started in that job uh, back in September. And uh, you know he's been working as the editor um, all during this time. And um, you know, when he started his position at the Bayview, and you know, Nube, I'm sure, can fill in you know a lot of the details about the Bayview better than I can. But I'm just going to summarize. Um, he was in pre-release status at the Taylor Street Center, which is a halfway house operated by a private prison contractor, essentially a private prison uh, in the middle of the Tenderloin. And um, I'm going to pause you just for a clarifying question. He was on what status? Can you repeat that? Uh, it's pre-release status. Um, so the BOP, the Bureau of Prisons, um, allows prisoners to, uh, I think, six months before their release date to go into um, pre-release status, um, which allows them to like, transfer to a halfway house, a minimum security facility where they can reintegrate into the community and uh, also you know, work as part of the, you know, the conditions of their pre-release. And that's what you know, Malik was permitted to do. He was permitted to serve as the editor of the paper, which includes you know, reporting, fundraising, doing administrative work. Um, and you know, at least as you know, our position is that Malik uh, had an understanding that he would be permitted to conduct press conferences, um, interviews, and attend events um, around the Bay Area as part of being the editor. So, um, you know, he, he starts at this job, um, you know, he, you know, like everything's, everything's going well, essentially. And then in January, um, starting January 8th, um, a COVID outbreak starts at the Taylor Street facility. Um, a memo gets distributed to a lot of the uh, facility residents. It's not a confidential memo. And Malik uh, speaks with a number of individuals, including uh, Tim Redmond, who's the editor of the blog 48 Hills, um, and lets him know that there's a COVID outbreak going on. And uh, at the same time, the San Francisco Bay View uh, also publishes a press release um, stating that a COVID outbreak is happening at the facility. And then Tim Redmond uh, emails um, executives over at the GEO group asking about this COVID facility, uh, about this COVID outbreak. Um, you know, he doesn't mention Malik. Um, you know, he doesn't interview Malik. Um, you know, there's no quotes by Malik uh, in any of the articles that Tim Redman put out. But obviously the GEO group knows that something is up once, you know, Tim starts questioning them. And initially they deny that the COVID outbreak is taking place. And then immediately after that, they retaliate against Malik. Um, you know, they, they uh, confiscate his cell phone. They stop him from going to a press conference that he was scheduled to go to. And then they also informed him that before he speaks to any members of the press, um, he needs to obtain authorization from the Bureau of Prisons um, as well as the GEO group. Um, and, um, you know, that's, those are the events that led to Malik filing the lawsuit. And, you know, just to be very brief, since Malik filed the lawsuit, they've imposed additional charges on him. They've actually charged him with escape, um, which is much more serious than the charges that uh, you know they had on him previously. And escape could potentially lead to Malik being transferred out of the Taylor Street facility and being put back uh, into jail. Um, so you know that's she, okay. Yeah, that that's the overall situation. So just to be clear that we have an understanding of this, Malik is released to this transitional home. And while there, part of the idea is to reintegrate into society and to find employment, get back on your feet. So he does this and in, in a job as a journalist, essentially. And then he finds out that there's a COVID outbreak. I'm just making sure I have the details and shares it with somebody who covers it. And then he's told he can no longer speak to the press. And he, in a sense, is the press, right? So this is very complicated. Exactly, right. Okay. 
just yeah. making sure we've got it. And what can you add for us? Um, I'd like to add a lot. Um, first of all, just, just that last statement alone, um, uh, a member of the press can't speak with the press. So we're talking about we're talking about censoring journalism. We're talking about the censoring of voices um, uh, and making it dangerous for other people to speak to someone who is doing his doing his work, right? So that essentially, um, I, I feel like is is that should be a violation. That should be something that we as community members should be outraged about. You are telling me I someone can't speak to another person. I mean, we're, we rely on the press and especially the San Francisco Bayview National Black Newspaper, which speaks about issues that directly, um, that are directly in, um, are, affected, are affecting the community. They, th this is a newspaper that, that provides a platform for the people's voices to be heard, to talk about and report so that we can report on issues that are affecting our community. And so putting other, other people um, in an uncomfortable position to do their work is, is very damaging. And it's, it, it, it's um, and, and again, it's something that we should be, uh, we should uh, really be intolerant of. So, that's just that. But um, if we start from the beginning, I, the, the, in my view, as Malik's partner, when he was at the half, when he came to the halfway house, the idea in our minds, of course, is that this is the place where you go to transition so that you can have an easeful transition into your new life. Malik had been, um, had been incarcerated for over 13 years. So he's going to need that time. People need that time, right, to make that, that transition. And not only did he have a job, he had, he had support here on the outside. He had not, not only just a job at the Bayview, but a meaningful job, a beautiful job, something that made him happy. And doing the work that he had been preparing to do many years prior to um, getting out of prison. He had written for eight years to the, to the Bayview. His articles are in that newspaper. So, and he had a loved one here on the outside that he could come to, that we could start building a life together, building a fan, you know, uh, well, I mean, we aren't going to build the traditional kind of family, but we're going to build our own family, right? To, together. Um, and yet, and, and, he was eligible for, for home confinement and yet they didn't give it to him. And I also just found out that in his first month of being at 111 Taylor, St Taylor Street facility, he had asked to um, go into, um, to have a, go into a, a drug treatment program because he um, had an addiction problem that he had, and he has been sober. We, we celebrated his sobriety, 13 years of sobriety in October, October 7th. But in that That's first big. month, yeah, it's huge. And I didn't even know until just a couple of days ago that in September, when he arrived, he had asked to be put into a, a drug treatment program to make sure that he would, to, would stay sober because 111 Taylor Street facility that is owned by GEO is smack dab in the middle of the tenderloin. And the first thing that he saw when he got out of the car from being driven from the airport were people on the street, sitting on the sidewalks, people shooting up, doing, I mean, it was there. In, so he wanted to take care of himself and they denied him. They denied him the very thing that first of all, that he asked for and that in his mind, he wanted to, that he felt like he needed to make sure that stepping out every day into the free world with, with that being, being faced and that they denied him says everything about the inhumane treatment. The, I, I feel like 
that's retaliation right there. That's saying, we actually don't care about your, your care. We are just yeah. here. Yeah, so, and, I mean, and I was going to say, when we think about why does recidivism happen and why do people yes. fall back and they're asking and there's a lack of infrastructure. I, I even have a curiosity as to why, I wonder why this transitional home is right smack in the middle of this particular neighborhood. I imagine you have a, a theory on that as well, but. Well, I just have very strong feelings on that. I realize that this is a rhetorical question. And the bottom line is, Geo Group is a, is a, is a, is a for-profit prison organization, right? They make money by having those people in their, in, in their clutches. And as a matter of fact, there is a number. It is $19,000 a month that they receive to have Malik and the others caged in their, in their system. They could care less if these people recidivate or if they go down. Because- 19,000 per person? Yes. Well, sorry, this is what I understand for um, the federal prisoners because they also house state prisoners there. So I don't, and I don't know what, I just know for Malik. So your theory is, because I, you know, I really, it might sound rhetorical, but I really am curious. And so your vantage point might be, it's kind of built into the system. It's in their profit interest if people recidivate is what you're of saying. Of course, and of course, or they just want to keep them there. You know, I mean, Malik is outspoken and they knew that he was outspoken before and he should, he has every right to be, to be able to, to speak. I, I mean, he has every right to speak. It's not as if he's in jail for, for liable. He, that has nothing to do with his, be, speaking should have nothing, speaking out, even if they don't like what he's saying. So? It, it's not their job to, it shouldn't be their job to control what it is that he's saying. He's a human being and his job requires him to speak out. So yes, my feeling is they're retaliating from, from, the, very, the, from the very beginning. And, and to deny him home confinement, why would you deny someone home confinement if uh, apparently on your, your website, your, your mission is to respect the human rights and the dignity of the people under your quote care. And yet you have someone who loves him, who wants him to be with, in my case, me. And this is happening to thousands of other people. We now have, a, I moved from San Jose to San Francisco so we could be together, so we could be at work together. And we have a beautiful place that he's paying rent on with me with the, from the work, from the, um, from the, um, from his employment. So he has a job, he has a place to stay. He has a support system. He is, he has stayed sober, sober. He has had, a, they, they randomly drug test people and he has been clean, of course, every time. He is not being rewarded for any of those things. Instead, when he does his due diligence to speak out about a COVID outbreak, because if because people are scared to speak out. Why are people scared to speak out? Because they know they're going to be retaliated against. Thankfully, Malik just happens to be one of those people. It's like, this is not okay. We need to get this out and I'm going to take the hit. So they don't reward him for having a job. They don't reward him for staying sober. They don't reward him for actually having someone in his life that is saying, yes, I would like to move, uh, to help him to move forward and have this place. They don't give, they, they deny him home confinement. And yet he speaks out about a public health crisis that's taking place within the facility and they are going to retaliate against him. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, there, there's a lot going on here. And then um, as part of this, just a couple of follow-up questions because I think there's so much to get at here. So um, retaliation looks like being told that you can no longer speak to the press and you're kind of essentially on house arrest. Is that right? Uh, yeah, let, let me, let me. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you know, Malik was um, not placed under house arrest. Uh, in the sense of, you know, being confined uh, to the center and not being allowed to work. He has been allowed to work. 
um, during this time, although he was prevented from going to the press conference um, immediately, you know, after, well, immediately when the retaliation took place. Um, you know, his cell phone was taken away from him, which got in the way of him being able to do his work, um, you know, and network with like other journalists. And also, you know, Malik, you know, he works in incredible hours, you know, like, I don't know, like when he sleeps, you know, he seems to be like working like 15 hours a day and he would regularly work in the evenings after he got back, you know, from the bakery, or, you know, in his room. And he wasn't able to do any of that, um, you know, after the retaliation. The, the, the real, you know, like the, the real restriction is that he's been barred from being able to do his job, essentially, like, you know, to speak to other members of the press. And, you know, there are collaborations that the Bayview has with um, other newspapers. There's a newspaper called El Tecolote, which is a bilingual Spanish English paper. Um, and they had, a, um, they had a project called the Black and Brown Media Consortium, um, which, you know, fell apart after, the retaliation took place. Um, but you know, at this point, we're not we're not just looking at some you know restrictions on what Malik can do as part of his job. We're really looking at him potentially losing his job um, and being transferred out of the facility altogether, um, which would be horrible for him, but also you know a blow which you know the baby might not recover from. Um, I mean, the paper has existed for is, is it forty something years, Nube? Forty five. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's been a voice in the community for 45 years, and that's really what, you know, this is striking at. It's not just Malik, it's really the voice of the community. Yeah, so I guess that's what I wanted to delve into just a little bit more. Um, so if he's barred from speaking to members of the press, and he is a member of the press, is he also barred from, is he allowed right now to write an article, even though he no longer has his essential tool. I mean, think about it. I couldn't have scheduled my interview with you. We coordinated on our phone, right? Like we need the phone to do our work. So does he just have like these big obstacles in the way or has he actually been told you cannot do work right now as part of the press? Well, yeah, let, let, let me respond to this one. Um, it's always been extremely unclear um, what, um, you know, the scope of Malik's actual job responsibilities are. And um, I can say that, um, you know, the Department of Justice has filed their um, opposition to our motion. We're seeking an injunction, you know, ending all disciplinary charges against Malik. And in the opposition, they claim that Malik was always subject to a condition that he never be outside of the baby offices in any, in any way. He was entitled to publish, you know, uh, articles in the Bayview, but not entitled to be outside of the Bayview offices. And they claim that this is one of the conditions of his employment. And the letter that they use as evidence of it simply says, your employment will start on September 3rd or something like that. It, do, it doesn't specify what the scope of what Malik is permitted to do is. Um, I mean, we do know that Malik has published for months, you know, without any adverse action against him. Um, he's also appeared in public at rallies as the editor um, and the GEO group knew about this and they didn't retaliate against him in the past. They only elected to retaliate against him, um, you know, we're alleging after he broke a story about the COVID outbreak. So um, it's really, you know, there's no document or anything saying Malik is, you know, able to do A, B, and C, but not D, but, you know, they've never had any problem with him publishing. Um, they only have problems when he talks about a COVID outbreak. Yeah, this is very interesting. And um, it's almost sounding like, I mean, if your job is to be the editor of a newspaper and thereby you're also reporting as happens with smaller publications or publications that have a small staff, then being outside of the office feels like a piece of what you would do, right? Because you have to report on the news. Um, so this is a very sticky situation. I think Nube had a comment. Go for it, please. I am just, I am just so, incensed because first of all also the the taylor street was trying to cover up the COVID 19. I, I, they they were trying to deny that it was actually taking that that an outbreak had actually happened that's that's the other thing so they 
and that they have the ability to retaliate against him. They just have these this kind of arbitrary authority to retaliate against people and threaten to send them back to prison for the, for exposing their wrongdoing should just, I mean, it should just be enraging to anyone. And I, I consider this, these for myself, I consider these things to be like human rights violations because this is exactly what responsible community members would be, would be doing. And to sort of try to silence somebody, especially someone in the media, someone who is, who is tasked to protect and provide a space for the for the community voices and and the community, it's just it, it's just in, enraging to me. And then this idea that that there aren't any specific rules, and there really shouldn't be in place around okay. The, the BOP says, okay, you start your job on this date and you can only go from here to your job. That kind of control over people's movements as you are trying to integrate and, and move into and transition into free society, I, I think is just another, uh, again, I, I just feel like it's another human rights violation to people's Move, natural movements like oh so you're gonna say that if he goes from on his way to his to his job he sees um he, he goes to a, a rally then he's he's out of compliance because he didn't get permission to why does he need permission he's already out he, you know, why aren't his movements, which is happening to everybody, apparently. I mean, I under, I understood that they were told that they couldn't, if you, if you can go from work to your place. Can't go to Target if you need some underwear, unless you get permission. What this, these kinds of, this kind of arbitrary control over people is not really conducive to a, a real transition from prison into society, right? And I, so I, I just, th this, these arbitrary rules, I just, I, I really wanted to point that out because as his partner, how this affects just the personal aspect of Malik beyond the, the, um, the lawsuit is also very important. I just and 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 important to him tr this transition, right? For and sure. How, how he conducts how he conducts his himself in his in his world. Okay, yeah, for sure. And I'm glad you added that. Um, it adds extra context. Um, I guess the other two things I want to dig into a little bit more. Um, so one is I think Richard, you mentioned. Well, actually, first before we get there. Let's talk about the COVID outbreak at the transitional house that he got in trouble for speaking about um, after getting a non-confidential uh, memo. What, how big was the COVID outbreak? What did it look like? Um, I can answer that. Um, so there are no public statements from GEO or the Bureau of Prisons about what they did to protect people from the COVID outbreak. Um, or um, you know, the scope of the outbreak and they never responded to any of the publicity. Um, and I do wanna mention actually that a documentary broke just uh, yesterday. There was uh, put out by the San Francisco Public Defender. It's called uh, COVID at 111 Taylor Street. Um, and it's available on a website uh, that they put out under the Adachi project, which is a wearedefender.com. I think it might be .org, um, we are Defender, And you can watch uh, the documentary there. It was filmed by um, a client of the public defender uh, secretly at, at uh, great risk to themselves. And, uh, you know, it shows you the conditions uh, inside the facility um, during the COVID outbreak that happened last year um, in 2020. And, you know, you can see like people are wearing masks. There's actually a rule. <laughs> 
that says that it's a violation of the conditions of your parole to wear a mask. So there are people in the facility without masks. Um, you know, there are people in the break rooms who are not social distancing. And the documentary shows that um, individuals who had COVID were transferred out of the facility, uh, presumably quarantined, and then reintroduced into the facility in dorms with people who were not COVID positive. And um, you know, that particular practice um, is something that happened actually in a lot of prisons across California too. It's one of the reasons we ended up with the coronavirus outbreak you know, that tore through the California prisons because for a long time, Department of Corrections was just taking people who had COVID and transferring them into these dorms you know, where there were like hundreds of people and many of whom were like COVID negative. Um, you know, so that's what was happening at the Taylor Street facility. We don't know what GEO did in response to this outbreak. Um, the only information um, I'm aware of is the statistics on the Bureau of Prisons website that said that there were five COVID cases. Um, and I believe that uh, it's possible that the memo that they sent out announcing the outbreak said that those individuals were transferred off site, I'm not certain about that. And now the website says that there's one case. So, you know, presumably they transferred everyone out, but we don't know like if any staff uh, caught the coronavirus um, or, you know, what protective measures are being taken. So. We do know though, as you said, that COVID has really wreaked havoc on those who've been incarcerated. And so now we're learning that not only is it an issue in the prison system, but also in transitional um, spaces as well. Um, and, you know, it, it should be noted, too, that, like, everybody at the, well, not everybody, but people at the Taylor Street facility are going out into the community. <laughs> so not documenting and responding to news about the outbreak is a serious health concern to everyone in San Francisco. Right. It seems like there's a big, in the midst of a pandemic, from even a public health perspective, um, there hasn't I mean, it goes without saying that there hasn't been the same amount of care granted to people who are incarcerated, but this is a particular, it seems like it would be even more of interest, right? When people are going in and out of the facility. Um, okay, and you did mention that there's a threat of, of a greater charge, which is, did you say escapism? Uh, escape, yes. Okay, can you talk about um, what does that look like and um, what grounds are they, resting this on? Right. Um, the disciplinary charges are not for escaping in, in terms of escaping from the facility. They're not alleging that, you know, Malik ran away or something like that. Uh, escape in this context means that he was um, somewhere where he was not authorized to be under his work release program. So um, what the, well, what, what happened um, and, you know, like, um, and, you know, these are facts that we allege in the lawsuit is that after um, filing the complaint um, on February 1st, we held a press with, uh, conference on Tuesday, February 2nd. The next day, um, an individual from the GEO group called the San Francisco Bayview and asked um, where Malik was during that press conference because he spoke at the conference. And uh, Mary Radcliffe, who's the co-founder of the paper, responded that he was actually in the Bayview offices. So they couldn't charge him with anything based on that particular press conference. Um, instead, they went back in time um, to a rally that took place in front of UC Hastings all the way back in November. And um, you know, they they claim in their papers that they discovered this event um, you know, after the press conference. And they're charging him with escape based on that, um, based on the theory that um, Malik is not permitted to be anywhere other than at the Taylor Street facility or at this baby offices. So he was violating the conditions of his pre-release by being at that rally. Now, what's interesting about that rally is it was co-sponsored by the Bayview. <laughs> And Malik attended that rally as the editor of the Bayview. Um, he did speak at the rally, but he also reported on the rally and, you know, produced like, you know, a video like segment that he put on Instagram. And, you know, that, that's what they're charging him for. So. Right. And also um, 
you know, you've both pointed out that the rules were very arbitrary and if not for speaking out, they might not have had to dig back into history to find like, when did he go off the beaten path? It sounds like to me as somebody who's far removed. Um, I've gotten the warning that we have 10 minutes left. And so I wanna spend some time talking about, first of all, where's Malik right now and how is he doing? And then I wanna know um, kind of what the plan is and then how, how people can be supportive or what they can do to go forward. Hi, <laughs> okay. Um, so Malik um, also has um, a, another job. So he, he is there right now. Um, but he's doing okay. I mean, this is a really stressful situation um, for so many reasons. Obviously, he doesn't want to go back to prison, obviously, especially for something just so fundamental to, um, you know, a, a person's right to be is the way I see it. So obviously, I have a very humanitarian lens that I take with this. Um, and I just find it quite egregious, but um, he is doing great. I mean, he is, he's doing okay. You know, he's a strong, he's a strong individual. He does have, um, he's also intelligent. Um, he, um, you know, he has done nothing wrong and he is standing by it. Um, he has, he has support and uh, we are also, um, so we're, you know, we are in this fight and we are getting ready to, um, we are going, can I say, uh, Richard, about um, our, our future plans for the rally? Yeah. Okay, so so we are getting ready uh, to, uh, to, to mobilize and, and, and do a rally that will be um, on March 7th. Um, so we're kind of, we're saving the date and, and we are also doing um, a, a fundraiser because uh, we obviously have accrued legal fees um, to, to fight this case. This is not something that we obviously were prepared for. The San Francisco Bayview National Black Newspaper, I mean, it's an independent newspaper. Um, we're always scrappy, we're, you know, we're always having to, to raise funds in order just to, just to print the paper, which is incredibly important as well. So we really, really need Malik here. I mean, again, we have you know, these elderly people who have passed the torch, we need to keep this newspaper going. And one of the main reasons that we need to keep the paper going in print is because it goes to the inside. We, we are a, a voice for the prisoners inside. This is a place where they, um, we create a, a, a dialogue and, a, and, a, and a, a collaboration with them on the inside. It's so important that they get this newspaper and that can only happen if it stays in print. So we are going to be, um, we have set up a fundraiser to, um, to help with the legal fees and to keep the paper going because uh, with, with Malik being gagged like this um, and being threatened to, to go back to prison has, has hurt not only um, the, the newspaper and, and him. But again, I will say also, um, this is just very stressful for someone who is trying to, to just be in his free life. And then really quick, just a quick technical question. So in this particular moment, has he had to step away from the Bayview right now while you're working, while the case is in progress? Yeah, in some ways, he, I mean, he can't speak, you know, he, he can't speak, he can't be involved, you know, so yes. Okay. Um, and you mentioned an upcoming rally on May, on March 7th, which I think we'll hear more about. So keep me posted and I'd love to keep covering that. Um, and Richard, what would you like to add about things that people can do to be supportive um, to Malik and others who might be in this vulnerable position? Yeah. Um, you know, we've really been grateful to all the support um, that people have extended to Malik. Um, it's really been um, quite amazing. Um, to me personally, you know, all these people from, you know, different um, aspects of the community and all these people who have been involved in struggling for like civil rights and the rights of incarcerated people have been willing to like step up and also organize on his behalf. Um, you know, I, I hope that, um, you know, I think the one way that like people can, you know, contribute, um, you know, is to support uh, Malik uh, when the rally takes place. Um, and also, uh, you know, to contribute to that fundraiser because he does need funds for his legal defense. Okay, anything else that either or both of you would like to add or any other question that you wanted, you had hoped I'd ask, but I didn't? 
I just want to say thank you really for for allowing this space and and also to allow the space of a family member, a loved one, because often we do not get to hear from us about how how what our formerly incarcerated or incarcerated uh, loved ones are going through. So yes, freeing Malik and supporting Malik is really about also supporting incarcerated people, the thousands of people that don't necessarily have this kind of support, that are afraid to speak up, that are, that could, you know, could trip up, they are being set up to be tripped up in, in, in so many ways. And so um, by, by focusing on this, it really is shining the light on what is really taking place for thousands of people and their families. Um, I did think of something I wanted to add to um, you know, Malik can't be here. Um, you know, he can't speak for himself now. Um, but, you know, one of the things I always hear him say is that, you know, this isn't just about him. Um, it's really about everybody else at the Taylor Street facility. And it's also about private prisons in California. Um, you know, this is really part of a larger struggle to get rid of private prison contractors and get them out of California entirely. And, you know, I think that if he were here, um, that's one thing that um, you know he would want to say uh, to all of your listeners. So. Absolutely, thank you, Richard. Thank you. And can you direct listeners to like, is there a site or a GoFundMe page or something that you want to share um, if people want to go and learn more about um, Malik's case? Definitely, please just go to the sfbayview.com website and the the GoFundMe uh, for um, to freeing Malik and. Um, and helping with the legal fees will be there, sfbayview.com. Great, thank you both for your time. Um, also, just as a preview, um, I'm so sorry, what was your name again? Nube. Nube. Um, I am doing a special International New Women's Day newscast on March 7th, highlighting the voices of women and talking about ways in which they've been impacted by the pandemic. I think I'd love to have you um, I'd like to reconnect with you and include, include your voice as somebody who's the partner of somebody who's so directly impacted. And if you'd be willing to do that, I think you have a very powerful story to share. Oh, thank you so much. I would be very, uh, uh, yes, I will accept that invitation. Thank you. Okay. And thank you so much, Richard. I will, um, I will get in touch with both of you to follow up on this case. So thank you for um, your time today. Yeah. Thanks for having us on. <laughs> All right. Take good care. See you, Sharon. Have a good Bye. Night.